This is Duke University. Apocalypse. We've got <laughs> you know, press recently. Uh, I'm trying to be a moderate atheist. 
And in fact, I differ from a lot of atheists in that I think there are objective wrongs. I mean, look, I think rape is wrong. I don't think we have to go, well, I wonder whether rape is okay in New Guinea and do some kind of sociological survey. No, it's wrong there, too. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that about several things, you know, racial discrimination, uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, torture, murder, and so on. Uh, and I think some things are not immoral that many uh, Christians do think are immoral, uh, such as gay love and embryonic stem cell research. Notice I say many Christians. A lot of Christians don't think those things are wrong. And so whenever you talk to an individual, you've got to figure out you know, exactly what they think so you can try to interact with them. Okay? But at least some Christians, many Christians, uh, make three common claims. When they say, we can't be good without God, they mean, first of all, atheistic individuals or societies are not good because they don't believe in God. Second claim is not about belief, but it's about the existence of God. That you can't have real objective right and wrong without a God that exists. Uh, and third is a knowledge claim. Well, maybe there is something right or wrong, but you can't know what's right or wrong without guidance from God in some way. So I'm going to take those one at a time. First, the empirical claim. That atheistic individuals and societies uh, cannot be morally good. The argument is typically given, hey, Look at Stalin, look at Mao, look at Hitler. They're all atheists and they were horrible people. Well, there are a lot of reasons why that's bad. It's not, you know, one reason is, sure those people were bad. I agree, they were horrible. But they weren't bad because they were atheists. They were bad because they were demagogues and ideologues and, uh, and bad in many, many ways. They have nothing to do with their atheism. Uh, and secondly, of course you can't generalize from three examples uh, of bad atheists to all atheists. In fact, they're good atheists, and they're bad atheists, and they're good theists, and they're bad theists. So the empirical claim, if it's about individuals, just turns out to be false. Atheists, you know, you can be good without believing in God. The good atheists show that. Now some people say, but there's still a probability, there's a tendency. But if there's a tendency, it should show up in social statistics. I mean, we're talking about an empirical question here, so we want real empirical evidence. So they've done surveys. And Paul in 2005, a nice follow-up by Jensen in 2006. Uh, if you buy my book, don't just borrow it, buy it. <laughs> you know, the complete references. Um, and what those studies find is that, in fact, religious belief is correlated with higher rates of murder. Now, what kind of religious belief you want to ask? It's not just belief in God, it's belief in God and the devil. Then, it's more likely you're going to believe, you're going to, have a, you're going to live in a society with a higher murder rate if um, most people in that society believe in the devil. And in addition, juvenile suicide, sexually transmitted disease, adolescent pregnancy and abortion, all of those things end up being correlated. Now, that doesn't show you a causal connection, but it does show you at least that atheism doesn't increase those things. Right? And so the claim turns out to be false. And in addition, of course, there's questions of intolerance and prejudice, uh, which have always been correlated with religion. Uh, just as an empirical fact, I mean, you just have to look at the studies there. So the empirical claim is false, or at the very least, it's unsupported by the evidence. The second claim about, which I call the moral claim, is about whether there can be real objective right or wrong without God. This is the one that's often attributed to Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. If God is dead, then everything is permitted. And Nietzsche thought that, uh, but Dostoevsky wasn't an atheist. He didn't believe it. It was just a character in his book. Uh, most atheists don't believe that, right? They think, or at least I think, there is objective right or wrong, even if there's no God. So the real challenge is, how could that be coherent? Well, why not? The only way you can get an argument that you can't have real objective right and wrong without God is if you think that right and wrong somehow depend on God. And the only theory that I've seen proposed that really entails that is the divine command theory, which says what makes an act right or wrong is simply God's commands. If he commands you not to do it, it's wrong. If he commands you to do it, uh, it's not wrong. Then, if there were no God, nothing would be morally wrong. But the problem for that's been known since Plato's Euthyphro. 
Uh, you got to ask, so, okay, God commanded us not to rape, but did he have a reason for that command? Well, if he didn't have any reason to issue that command, then it's just arbitrary, and how can it create a moral duty? But if he did have a reason, then it's that reason for issuing the command that's what it makes rape wrong. It's not the command itself, it's the reason for issuing the command. And the reason is, of course, the victim of rape gets hurt horribly. That's what makes rape wrong, not some kind of command from God. So, the challenge, of course, is, okay, so that theory doesn't work, but what do you got that's better? And the answer is, I think it's wrong to harm people. I mean, it's not that, you know, it's not that mysterious. What makes rape wrong is that an agent who's responsible and knew what he was doing caused tremendous harm to another person who has rights just like he does and had no adequate reason for doing so. And that's kind of a general principle. Societies might argue about what counts as an adequate reason, who exactly gets protected, who's a responsible agent, which harms are serious. There are going to be disputes of interpretation, but the general format is something that's sheared the world over. Uh, from society to society, including non-religious society. <coughs> so rape is a perfect example of that. What makes it wrong is, is just what I said, the harm to the victim. Okay. So the second conclusion is that not only is the empirical claim wrong, but also the moral claim is wrong. Namely, real objective moral rightness and wrongness does not depend on the existence of God. Even if there were no God, those acts would still be wrong. The third claim, however, is how do you know? How do you know it's right or wrong? And look, I'm the first to admit it. A lot of these questions are extremely difficult and controversial, and I don't have the answers any more than anybody else does. Uh, my response is just that at least sometimes we can get answers, reach consensus, and be justified in those answers without reference to religion at all. And a perfect example of how that happens is a hospital ethics committee. You get together a bunch of people with different perspectives, they, they work hard to figure out what the facts are of the case. They interview the different people involved. They look at it from different perspectives. Now, they're sometimes going to still agree, disagree, but when they do agree, that's a good justification for believing, hey, there's, you know, there's justification for that conclusion. All these people with different perspectives who are informed and impartial and trying to do their best to reach the morally right conclusion agree on it. Uh, that's the kind of uh, justification, that's the kind of method that I would want to use to figure out the answer to a moral question. Talk to people, work it out, get informed, and so on. Then the next response to the objection is, well, what about believing in God? Would that really help you? Okay? Would it really help you? Well, you got to know which God to believe in or which religion to adopt. you got to know which priest to follow if you're going to listen to a priest about what God says or doesn't say. Or, if you've got a sacred text, which passage in the text to believe. Look, there's great stuff in the Bible. Don't get me wrong. There's wonderful stuff in the Bible. There's also horrible stuff in the Bible. And you have to decide which passages to believe in and which ones to follow. That requires an independent test of what's right or wrong. So when the Bible says, and this is the New Testament, uh, Ephesians 6, 5, Slaves, be obedient to those who are your earthly masters, with fear and trembling and singleness of heart, as to Christ. You've got to think, oh, well, now we're getting commanded, slaves are getting commanded to obey. Does that mean that it's right to obey and wrong not to obey? Well, what about killing? Um, one of my favorites is, if your brother, the son of your mother, or your son, or your daughter, or the wife of your bosom, or your friend who is as your own soul, entices you secretly, saying, let us go and serve other gods, you shall not yield to him, or listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor shall you conceal him, but you shall kill him, because he tried to get you to... Now, that was the Old Testament, to be fair. Uh, so let's go back to the New Testament. As for the cowardly, the faithless, the polluted, as for murderers, fornicators, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their lot shall be the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Whoa, liars go to hell. Who among us is not going to hell under that, under that standard? Uh, 
and Matthew on family values. Don't imagine that I came to bring peace to the earth. No, rather a sword. I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What could be worse than sending a daughter-in-law against her mother? <laughs> <laughs> There's enough problems. And finally, women. Uh, you know, most Christians, don't, they don't like these verses. These are not the ones you hear in church because they're not going to uplift you. They're just going to create problems. Uh, but that's what this is what the Bible says. Women should be silent during church meetings. They are not to take part in the discussion, for they are subordinate to men, as the Scriptures also declare. That's New Testament. That's not Old Testament. And it's repeated not just in 2 Corinthians, but in Timothy and Colossians. So... If you want to go to the Bible for guidance, I think that's fine. But you've got to use your judgment. Follow the verses that seem right. Don't follow the ones that seem to be obviously wrong. And then it turns out the Bible's not really guiding you. It's a bouncing board to, you know, bounce your ideas across. But so are novels. So it's not clear that it has any more status or, any, or that it's any better help uh, than a good novel. Uh, so it seems that religion is either necessary or helpful to determine what's morally wrong. So the knowledge claim is false. We already talked about why the empirical claim is false and the moral claim is false. So all three of them are false. So we can be good without God. So what do we need to do in order to be good? You just have to reduce harm. Don't hurt other people. Prevent harm for other people, right? And uh, which people? Well, the ones in this world. You want to focus on this world and preventing the harm in this world and helping people in this world and not think about some other world where maybe God or heaven is uh, but doesn't have the same relevance to morality uh, as harms to people in this world. disappointed with my answer to the question, do you need God to be good? Because I find I can't answer the question. I can't answer it because I'm not sure who the you is. I'm not sure what the nature of the need is. I'm not sure who the God is. And I'm not sure what the good is. I'm also ambivalent about the words to be. <laughs> and that just leaves us with the question, do, <laughs> which I'm sure could fill a great number of philosophical monographs on its own, <laughs> but for this afternoon's gathering deals it isn't quite enough, really. I'm going to explain my misgivings briefly before offering a constructive theological proposal. Let's start with the words you and good which I'll look at together. The word good is used in a host of ways in ethics. It can refer to the keeping of rules, commands, duties, or obligations. It can mean resulting in good outcomes, in solidarity with oppressed peoples, oriented to appropriate final goals or constitutive of virtuous character. Theologians and philosophers have long sought foundational understandings of the good in such places as natural law or the categorical imperative. Not only has this quest failed to elicit an unambiguous answer, but the hermeneutics of suspicion so prevalent in the American Academy in the last 50 years has relentlessly fingered the identities and locations of those seeking what is now widely taken to be a false universal the male heterosexual Western subject. I could add some adjectives to that, but that gives you a sense of it. Thus the questions which good and whose good somewhat discredit any kind of ethics that isn't prepared to put an adjective on the front and replace words like you and we with a suitably specific noun. Then I want to pause for a moment over the words need and God. Which God? I'm not at all sure that the God implied by this question has much significantly in common with the God that I believe in. Do you need God to be good? The way the question is set up, the point is to be good. 
God becomes an instrument, a piece of technology, a passport perhaps, that facilitates the achievement of the good. But that's a catastrophic impoverishment of the God Christians worship. Augustine of Hippo made a helpful distinction. There are things we use which run out, that are to be employed in order to get us to the things that don't run out, which are the things we enjoy. Speaking in this way of whether we need God to be good is to use God rather than to enjoy God. To ask the question, do we need this God, is to complete the Enlightenment turn to the subject. Ethics is no longer centered on God, with human beings, creatures seeking to live in the light of this God. Instead, ethics has become centered on human beings, with God being one of a number of devices we can use to achieve our purposes, in this case, being good. So when the question is posed this way, God becomes either a substitutable device or marginally beneficial accessory when we access it ourselves, or when proposed by someone else, an unjustifiable and insulting imposition. <coughs> that bears no resemblance to the God of Jesus Christ. So to summarize that so far, I think the question, do you need God to be good, offers a much too narrow description of humanity and a profoundly impoverished account of God. Otherwise, it's fine. <laughs> Having so ungraciously treated our question, I will say one thing I like about it. It's the words to be. Universal ethics, as I call it, that's to say ethics that seeks to establish universal rules that guide all peoples regardless of identity, <coughs> government, or context, invariably focuses on things people do. By contrast, virtue ethics is oriented to what people are, in other words, being good rather than doing good. So I'm glad to be asked a question about virtue ethics. But I don't believe you can do virtue ethics in a universal tone of voice. In other words, any notion of the good has to be grounded in a particular narrative, tradition, and community, and presumes corresponding practices and habits, all of which are oriented towards a particular telos or goal. Any universal notion of the good is simply a particular notion of the good shouted with a loud voice, <laughs> thereby concealing its corresponding narrative and its assumed telos, where it's coming from and where it's going. All of which means, I think, there is a notion of good that lies in the trajectory of Christian scriptures and traditions. It's perhaps most visible in the Beatitudes, a series of epigrams recalled in Matthew's Gospel and more briefly in Luke. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, the peacemakers, and so on. And then in each case he adds, because they will be comforted, they will inherit the earth, they will be filled, and so on. In other words, the good is that which abides with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit eternally. And if you want to be with the Trinity forever, you'll want to be with Jesus where he's found now, which is with the meek, those who mourn the poor in spirit. The Beatitudes have no notion of goodness in its own right. They only understand relationship with God in Christ now and forever, expressed temporally through compassion, holiness, and witness in the face of danger, and received eternally through joyful communion. Do you need God to discover this kind of goodness? It's an absurd question, because only through the God of Jesus Christ can one imagine such a notion of companionship with the Trinity now and forever. Why would one want this kind of eternal companionship forever if one avoided it when it was available now? In this perspective, God isn't a disposable or substitutable device for making us good. Relationship with God is the definition of good. And outside community, tradition, narrative, practices, and habits, there is no way of knowing what such a relationship might mean. There are two things that I'm not saying 
I'm not saying that Christians can't be moved, informed, humbled, and changed by those outside their faith, particularly when such people are much braver, more selfless, more generous, and more faithful than Christians are. This happens all the time. But it's always a provisional and occasional incidence, not a permanent philosophical given, because such people are headed for a different telos, and so their meeting and blessing on the path is always a blessed surprise. And I'm not saying that Christians are the only ones who have a discourse and pursuit of the good. There is no Christian monopoly. Quite the contrary, discourse about the good preceded Christianity and far exceeds the bounds of the church. I'm simply disputing that all these different discourses are talking about the same good. And so to sum up, do you need God to be good? You certainly do if you're a Christian, because your definition of good is wrapped up in being in relationship with God in Christ. But there are many other notions of goodness beyond Christian ones, and many of these have no notion of God. That doesn't make them bad theories, or make their conception of goodness inferior. There is no universal standard of goodness against which anyone could measure their objective merit. But for a Christian like me, while I find them interesting and informative, I could never settle for them. As the psalm says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good, happy are those who take refuge. Christianity is a sort of default that's kind of normal and non-Christian is strange. 
Um, I don't think that. I think I think Christians are strange. Um, strange, potentially dangerous. Um, and uh, as soon as I stop thinking of myself as strange, potentially dangerous, I'm kind of starting to get into that imperious mindset that says it's my job to dominate and benevolently legislate for uh, people who have no desire to be Christians and have no real interest in behaving Christianly without the, the faith and the joy that comes with it. So um, I, I, I do think morality is changing, but I think it's probably changing for the better. I'm not one of these people that says, oh, whoa, in the good old days, everyone used to subscribe to Christian standards and now we've all gone to pieces. I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to that narrative. I have to say many people who worship in my congregation do, but I don't subscribe to that narrative. Uh, I, I, I think Christianity flourishes when it has to give reasoned arguments, just exactly as I'm trying to do today with water. Uh, to very strong um, counter arguments. I actually, I mean, you know, I don't think Walter and I really disagree, certainly on this first two points at all, um, significantly, although I think we've got a different definition of God, but that's um, uh, slightly different. But, uh, eth you know, ethics, I think, has, has become much more broad. Uh, I think that, uh, and I think that's healthy for Christianity, healthy for the church, healthy probably for society in general provided that we realize, as Walter put very eloquently, uh, you know, public ethics happens when, as you described in the hospital board, when a whole bunch of people with different views get in a room together and hammer it out. Uh, that's, that's where it happens. I don't, I don't, I think it's terrible when Christians assume that simply because they've worked out what the logic of Christianity is, then they get to somehow impose it on the whole society. I think that's not as bad for society. I think it's terrible for his fantasy. Uh, well, I certainly agree. Secular ethics is, is you know, it's a good, it's a good move for society. It's a good move in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, you know, one reason is that if you start from secular assumptions, you're going to be able to share those assumptions with other people, and then when you have discussions with them, you're going to not reach as many dead ends and be able to solve more problems and arrive at consensus more often. If you have a hospital ethics committee where people are forming their ethical beliefs on the basis of uh, their Christian uh, faith, uh, and other people don't have that Christian faith, then it's hard to see how you're going to resolve anything or, or reach uh, some kind of agreement. Uh, and, and that's created actual practical problems in many hospital ethics committees, uh, which they figured ways around but still create problems. I also think that. Uh, secular ethics is more flexible in a way that's useful. Flexible in the sense that it can accommodate itself to the times. When something new comes up, you don't look at documents that are 2,000 years old for guidance. Uh, you think about the situation as it is today. And so if there's a part of, the, of a book that tells you, well, you ought to kill homosexuals, uh, and some people read that book and say, well, then homosexuals must be bad. And it's not, by the way, just homosexual. It's like masturbation. Uh, many things that today we find not morally questionable, there are, at least in large parts of the Christian tradition, uh, and based on Bible verses, uh, strong prohibitions against them. And if you take that as a rule, there's nothing that's going to ever change that. Because that Bible's not going to change, because it's 2,000 years old. So if we want to think about it now in a more flexible way to accommodate our moral beliefs to the society that we live in and the kind of people that we uh, interact with and face and are going to get affected by our decisions, uh, then it seems to me it ought to be on a secular basis. Uh, and third, it, I think it reduces uh, intolerance. I mean, it's fine to say that my moral beliefs are based on my Christian tradition, right, but I'm not going to impose them on you. But imagine that, you know, you marry the child of someone who thinks that you're immoral, right? Because of the kind of person you are or because of what you do. Well, that means it's going to be hard to relate to your, you know, to your, uh, to your 
was, I guess your father-in-law, sorry, I was about to say stepfather, I knew that one, right? To your father-in-law, or, or to anybody, suppose you get hired in a business, and it turns out your boss is a Christian, he says, well, I'm not going to impose it on you, but I want you to know, I think your lifestyle is immoral, right? You go, well, I'm glad you're not going to impose it on me, that'll make me feel a lot better. You know, I'd like to think that you really don't use your Christian religion. Uh, to form the belief that I'm uh, doing something immoral, that I'm not good. Uh, I think these beliefs, when people go, it's my private belief, I'm a Christian, I get to form my moral belief, I think they forget that we interact with each other in ways that require us to respect each other and to not think uh, that the other person is doing something immoral when they're not hurting anybody. Uh, so it's a good thing that people's moral beliefs are not getting based on those traditional sources as much anymore. It's going to lead to better personal relations, better decisions by hospital ethics committees, uh, better political environment, uh, and just a better society in many ways. Can I come back on a couple of those things? Yeah. No, well, the first thing is to say you always marry someone who, whose parents think you're immoral. <laughs> The reason for saying it is that I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm challenging that, 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 that there's this wonderful dreamland of secular ethics which is free of conflict and vested interests, mm -hmm. and that this, there's this uh, dreadfully bigoted land of Christian ethics on the other side which is full of demons and, and don't go in the dark. Jungle. I never said that. Uh, but, 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 when, but what I'm pushing you to do is, is to, to own up to some of the uh, Social location of some of the judgments that you're making. That, that you know, it's the, 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 the Christian is the person that says, I think your lifestyle is immoral, but no other um, business uh, uh, leader or um, the manager or any other parents in law would ever think wrong of, of somebody else. That's the logic. No, I, I never said that. No, you didn't say it, but you didn't need to say it because it seems to me it's the logic. What, what I'm pushing you to do is. Is that all we've got at the moment is the definition of the secular is, is a bunch of people who who don't have you know beliefs that are founded in a book written two thousand years ago. I mean, I think that's a slight caricature of Christianity. But I'm pushing you to, to, to bring forward what your positive notions of the good are, rather than simply uh, ones that emerge through discussion, which I think are you know very very appropriate, and 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 and, and ones that you know come down to things like do no harm. Uh, I'm looking for a richer notion of the good there, uh, other than the sense that you know people feel bad when they're, they're not very affirmed by their manager or their in-laws. I'm looking for a richer notion of the good there, and I'm not hearing it. Well, I, I only have ten minutes. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I mean, first of all, I didn't. I, I would never say that uh, you know that there aren't you know bigoted atheist bosses as well. Uh, what I said was there's empirical evidence statistically to show that it's more common among people with religious belief. If you want a standard of the good, at least with regard to moral goodness, I think preventing harm to other people is actually a quite broad notion when you consider that harm involves not just death, but all kinds of pain and discomfort, and that you shouldn't even risk those kinds of things uh, for other people. Like if you drive home drunk and you get home safely, it's still wrong because you risked it. So uh, I think a lot of uh, a lot of life is involved with not causing that kind of harm to other people, uh, and that a good person is somebody who tries their best to prevent harm in other people and to avoid causing harm to other people. Beyond that, you know, they can play golf or they can play tennis. They make a choice with the things that are neutral uh, in other respects. So the the picture of a good life doesn't have to be complete. I I grant you that there are. A lot more details I need to be filled out, but I'll just say again, you know, you can buy the book. In the book. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this question is actually very related to the discussion that you were just having. Um, if there were no religious institutions, would we know what was good and bad? And if so, how do we define what is good and what is bad? Um, that was Walter. Well, I, I, so if there were no religious institutions, I think we could determine what's good or bad the way hospital ethics committees do. And how would we define it, at least with regard to moral good and bad, goodness and badness? You know, goodness is preventing harm to other people, and badness is causing harm to other people. And we ought to, you know, minimize the amount of harm in this world, where harm is understood in a broad way, not just, ooh, I've got my kids, you know, but, you know, real harm, including disappointment, including frustration, including mental illnesses, including disabilities of a number of different sorts. 
Uh, now, again, you can't spell out much more than that in this, within this time frame, but that's the general picture. Um, I'm still looking for more than do no harm as a, as a, as a notion of the good, but, but um, if there were no religious institutions, well, I, I mean, I think I, you know, I'm more or less I think both of us really more or less covered that in no their opening remarks. But, but I, I think, again, I've challenged that notion of religious institutions. Uh, 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 if, if a religious institution is, is something that seeks to take you both in terms of values and, uh, and experientially beyond the, the everyday into, a, into a, a greater realm of experience and also assures your well-being uh, in the immediate and long-term eternal future, then I, I'm in charge of only one of, well, there's more than one of those institutions on the Duke campus, I suggest that Camera and the Duke Hospital are in the religious institutions <laughs> by that kind of definition. Um, and so I think basically if Christianity were abolished, we just invent something else to be our focus of esteem, possibly our focus of bigotry. I mean, I'm not saying there's any bigotry at Cameron. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we would we would create our idols, we create our temples, we create our systems, we create our our, 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 our respective um, final goals based on what builds up these kinds of forms of life. So, uh, I, I in general, uh, sure. I mean, there are different competing notions of the good, as I said. And, and we would go on having various different notions of the good. Um, but the idea that religion is something that can be abolished, I think, is, uh, is not Well, there are lots of societies out there that are secular societies that don't have very much religion at all. They seem to get along fine. Uh, uh, and they don't replace it with some other uh, religious notion. They get along fine without a religious belief of any, of any sort other than there's a little spark of goodness in us all. Which is I think Darwin doesn't have a little bit more than a little spark of goodness. I mean, I, I think it had all sorts of forms of civic religion. But my point was the empirical evidence is there are secular societies out there that get along fine without religious institutions. But, yeah, but that, that, I mean, that begs the question of what you mean by secular. Uh, I mean, no, by the religious institutions. Well, I just but by the definition that I just described, if you call Cameron and the Duke Hospital the religious oh. institution. Yeah, if you call them that, I think you're abusing the word religion. I mean, can't, I think I have the hospital a is not a amount of uh, authority on, 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 on whether or not to abuse the word religion. You can abuse it if you want, but, <laughs> but, but <laughs> hospitals are not religion. If by hospitals meet religious institutions, the answer would society be worse off without religious institutions than I grant you? They'd be worse off without hospitals. No, 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 no. I think I think that's not quite what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that we we. Hospitals have gained the authority they have in our contemporary society because that's where, in the absence of a, of a, of a, of a regular belief in a tangible connection to life after death, we worship our bodies in the present and, and we do everything we can to sustain life in the present for as long as we can and to enrich it as much as we can. And so it becomes, uh, it just, you know, it becomes a, a different form of religion. Doesn't follow the, the definitions that you know, which, which restricts religion to Christianity as well and Judaism and so on. But it still plays that kind of. It has that hold on the imagination, the 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 the, the imaginative power that a hospital has, and in a different way, the imaginative power that, a, that an athletic stadium has. I think is is suitably analogous to uh, what is always been thought of as religious power. It's not about the amount of net good that it does in society, because I, I still think you need a richer notion of the good even to get into empirical measurements of net good. Um, I, don't, I, know, I don't know how you can measure a net like a pump. I think it's not, hard, it's not hard to measure that there's an increase in harm when someone is right. Sure, but how do you measure the net lack of harm? Which is what you're defining good as you, you no, know, I was defining, you know, a good person is somebody who prevents, who, who, does, if who say, you prevents rape. rape. You can't. Someone who steps in and stops somebody else. Didn't happen yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. 
see what I mean. That's, that's just not relevant to my decision of whether to prevent a rape right now. If I see someone about to commit rape, I should step in and prevent it, because that's preventing no, no, harm. I, I'm, and it's I'm good to do so, it. and it doesn't matter <coughs> whether it's the reaction. You were talking about empirical measurements. I don't know how you measure how many rapes didn't happen yesterday. No, they don't have to. But, but, but you're talking about empirical measurements of the good and whether some societies have, uh, have a, you know, have a sufficient degree of good compared to other societies. I don't know how you measure that on the on the definition of good as lack of harm. Well, we can move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you think that this one will be, um, well, to start, uh, how do you think a non-ethicist would answer the question of where the human desire to be good comes from? A non-ethicist <laughs> would answer where does this human desire to be good comes from? I, mean, I can't ask for a non-ethicist. <laughs> Uh, but at least uh, a non-theist uh, like myself would say that the human desire to be good comes from evolution. And when we evolved in such a way that you know we're going to do a lot better with each other and get along a lot better and be happier in our own lives as well uh, if we um, do good for each other and get along and don't cause harm to each other and help each other avoid the harms that arise in our lives. Uh, we're going to make friends that way. The friends are going to make you happy in your own life, and it's also going to help the other people. So where does this desire for good come from? Is there were societies where people didn't have that inclination, and there were other societies where they did have that inclination. And the societies where they didn't have the inclination to help each other and prevent harms, well, there was a lot more harm, and they ended up dying out. And then the ones where there was an inclination to prevent harm for the other people in society, those societies thrived because you know, they reproduce more, they, and they respected each other more. And, uh, and so those increase. People with those tendencies then uh, proliferated and took over the population so that most people today have a very strong aversion to causing harm to other people and have a very strong inclination to prevent harm to other people. Uh, of course, you can get it beat out of you by bad social circumstances, uh, you can get incentives to do otherwise, but almost everybody has that inclination in them, uh, or those inclinations in them, uh, from the forces of evolution. Um, yeah, I think I'm, I'm struggling with this question because I, I don't think I'm good. You know, I think I'm in Christian vocabulary, as coined by Martin Luther, I'm, I'm a sinner who is at the same time justified. Um, so the, you know the Christian notion of good isn't that we all seek to want to be good in that sense. We all seek to want to be forgiven, uh, which is a you know it's, a, it's it's not doesn't necessarily displace the notion of good, but but it's you know it, it runs side by side to the notion of good. It doesn't mean we don't aspire to goodness, but but the, the notion of sin is, is one that, that recognizes we will never we will never get that. Oh, certainly not on our own. Um, so, yeah, so, say the, the question, say the question again. Uh, yeah. How do you think a non-ethicist would answer the question of where the human desire to be good comes from? Um, I, 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 I guess, uh, I would, yeah, again, I'm my also, I'm struggling with this notion of the non-ethicist, because it leaves, <coughs> uh, it's, it's quite broad, broad range, but, but leaving that aside, I mean, it's my understanding empirically, or, you know, non-theologically would be, as I described in my opening remarks, uh, societies <coughs> are made up of, of, of communities which are formed by traditions, and, and uh, those traditions uh, uh, evolve in practices and habits, and, and those who find a sense of well-being, which I think might be a, a different way of talking about good, are ones who find a place within a narrative, within that community, that, that makes them feel in some ways at home. I mean, that they belong in those kinds of places. So I, I think that would be a, a, a that sense of belonging. Um, you know, because belonging does require keeping certain rules, it does require sharing certain goals, uh, it does re require uh, acting in such a way that certain forms of life that benefit the community emerge, you know, most of the kind of things that ethics uh, talks about. Uh, so that sense of belonging, I guess, would be a non-religious, non-standard ethical way of talking about seeking good and where people find good. You know, and, and I, I guess, I mean, as 
basically, to use an analogy, of being an undergraduate at Duke. Uh, I think if you um, feel you understand the various narratives and practices that go up to being a Duke undergraduate, whether that's whatever you do on a Friday or Saturday night, whether that's how you relate to Cameron, whether that's how you relate to the major institutions around, it, uh, around the campus, then if someone's saying, are you having a good time, do you feel you're fitting, you know, when you go home at the uh, winter break or in, or in the summer, relatives and friends ask you how you're getting on, your sense of well-being will probably be about, be about whether you've kind of found a place there, whether you feel that there's a place for me here, and that ends up being more or less uh, how I understand the notion of the good without kind of a <coughs> structure. Um, we had everybody submit their questions beforehand. I feel like a lot of them have been answered already, so I'd like to open up the floor to anybody who would like to ask a question uh, based on the discussion. I think we'll spend maybe 20, 25 minutes on these. Um, okay, uh, this is a question for, I'm sorry, for Professor Walton. Well, okay. Um, could I just expand on your previous answer? Because for a lot of your um, concepts of secular ethics, you I can't remember which one was the previous. Oh, the evolutionary <laughs> explanation you just gave. The, ex the evolutionary yeah, can explanation. Can you expand on that? Because yeah. for a lot of your previous <coughs> answers for secular ethics, you've been relying on um, so-called empirical data. But for that kind of evolutionary, sociobiological, um, explanation. I don't see how. What is the empirical data for that, if there is any? And do you think that all of human questions about ethics can be reduced um, to that kind of excellent, um, evolutionary perspective? Uh, okay. So, with regard to the basic desire to be good in the sense of preventing harm, having the desire to prevent harm for other people, and the desire to not engage in causing harm to other people. Uh, I think it can be given a basic biological explanation. Okay? With, with and the empirical data? data? What? With empirical data? Well, a lot of, what kind of data do you want for an evolutionary explanation, right? I mean, any kind of evolutionary explanation is usually um, based on inference to the best explanation of observations of which types of populations thrive and which types of populations don't thrive, usually in other species, because we can't right now observe human evolution. Uh, so one thing would be you know, cross-species evolution to see, I mean, comparisons to see which species actually thrive, and it's the <coughs> ones who actually do you know, help each other. But uh, I mean, I don't have to cite particular papers. If you want references, I can give them to you later. But that's, the, that's one type of evidence. The other is, a, oh, what's his name, uh, Wilson. Uh, wrote a book called Darwin's Cathedral, which was a comparison of communities in early modern Europe. And this, they had lots of different city-states, and some of them had moral you know, rules of some sorts or other sorts. And a similar uh, comparison was done among the city-states in Greece by, and again, I know my memory's horrible, I'm sorry, but I can give you the references. Uh, <coughs> Princeton political scientist, and his name is, I can't remember. Uh, but in both cases, they found that uh, the, the city-states that thrived relative to the other city-states were city-states that had moral you know, norms of particular sorts, uh, which included not cheating, not causing harm to other people, preventing harm to other people, and so on. They actually thrived. And if you think about it, it's not that surprising. If you get, well, only people in my city-state, and somebody comes from the outside, I can cheat them and kill them, well, nobody's going to want to trade with them. Right? And then they're not going to thrive. And so the city-states with certain types of moral codes just did a lot better. And as a result, they took over because people would leave the other city-states and come to them, right? And they would, you know, have, uh, and they would just have more, more success in spreading the population and spreading the ideas. So that's the general kind of evidence. Now, that's not direct evidence for what happened when you were hunter-gatherers. So I grant you, you know, the evidence is spotty. Um, but uh, it's the same type of evidence you get for other types of evolutionary claims. All right. Um, so this is um, can a person who ascribes to religious belief by Walter's definition of religion, um, can this person vote or be a policymaker? I can say can. 
can or should. Legally, or should they be allowed to? <coughs> Not legally, but, but by your definition of, of, of an effective voter or policymaker, or would they be going against their own beliefs? So I, mean, I think somebody like that should be allowed to vote, and they can vote, and their views should be taken into consideration like other people. I mean, uh, they also ought to be willing to be open to listen to the people who disagree with them. But no, I would never take away their vote. Absolutely. So not, not, that, not that you should take away their vote, but how, how relevant, essentially, is a religious voice in the public sphere? It's going to have actual causal effects on what they vote for or against. You know, Christians uh, who hold very fundamentalist evangelical views vote very differently uh, from people who don't share those views. Uh, and again, that's kind of a statistical fact. It's not going to apply to everyone. They're liberal. Uh, they're liberal evangelicals. Uh, this guy Randall Balmer, uh, who endorses my book, uh, is a <laughs> liberal evangelical. Uh, so there are always exceptions, but statistically, uh, there are going to be patterns of voting that are associated with belief in the kind of traditional God that I define, uh, and uh, it does have an effect. Um, and is that legitimate or illegitimate? Look, everybody's got to work with their own beliefs. I'm not telling people they shouldn't decide. I just think you ought to do your best to make your beliefs accurate. Um, I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm I, I wouldn't disagree with what was said, but, but I, I, um, I think this idea that you use your vote to try to dominate society with your own views or the views of your sort of democracy <coughs> vote, I find really troubling for Christians, not for democracy. Uh, when I lead my people to the ballot box the weekend before voting begins, I, I mean, I wish. <laughs> um, what I'm telling them is your vote is there um, to be laid down for the sake of people possibly quite different to you who are probably much more needy than you. It's not to assure your self-interest. That seems to me the Christian way to vote. You don't vote to turn the whole country into a version of you. Uh, and just as democracy is fundamentally about making life safe for minorities, Likewise, uh, the Christian vote is about caring for the people who either don't or can't vote or don't have a say in society. So the idea of, you know, we're strong, put us together, we're a strong vested interest, the government have to listen to us, that's not, that's not language I find very comfortable to hear Christians or to be able to fight churches. So, what I don't understand is how a Christian who thinks that if you don't turn to Christ and get saved, you're going to spend eternity in hell. And if you do turn to Christ and get saved, you're going to spend eternity in heaven. And that the suffers of this world are just a drop in the ocean of time. Uh, if even that much, because it's infinite. Why that person wouldn't say, well, I'm going to decide which policies to vote for on the basis of which one's going to produce the most Christians. Because that is what's going to, according to the Christian worldview, reduce suffering overall. I would worry about people who vote that way, and I doubt that many Christians vote that way. But it sure would seem to be justified if they took their own views seriously. Yeah, I, I like that argument. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I get to choose my favorite question. Why is it very bad, please? Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have a comment and a question. I my Could you comment. stand up just so we can see you uh, while you're talking? Thank you. My slightly very big challenge. Um, so I guess my comment is, it's sort of, I almost feel like you guys have, are having two different discussions that sort of come into conflict at times, but I mean, um, it's sort of the idea of the basic notion of, you know, ethics as, you know, right and wrong. And that's, you know, to me, the prevent harm is a very solid, at least a very solid foundation for it. Yeah. But um, also, I think what Dean Walsh was trying to press is the uh, expanded notion of, you know, ethics as human flourishing. And that's, I think, um, I take, you know, his point to be that, um, you know, the, the, the language of harm doesn't, captured all the values that you know, we aspire as humans, that um, 
you know, I know harm is like this one big umbrella wall, you know, if you stop me from going to church, that's harm, so prevent harm, so now I can go to church, you know, pursue my own happiness. But it's sort of, I mean, I, I just find it on the descriptive level, it's not, it's the, the language harm doesn't you know, reach up to that extended notion of flourishing. Uh, so that was one comment. Um, and question for Walter. Oh, can yeah. I respond to that before you yeah. ask me? Because I'll forget the second, the first question. <laughs> <laughs> you go on, I just, my memory is no good. Um, no, I, uh, I meant for harm to be a test of moral, right and wrong, right? Uh, there are lots of other things, parts of life than morality. There's aesthetics, there's beauty, for example. There's uh, lots of other things. I enjoy golf, not because it prevents harm. Right? Uh, so there's lots of aspects to human flourishing in the sense of having a good life in that sense. It's just not clear that that's the moral issue. And I thought what we were asking about was morality and the basis of moral right and wrong. When it comes to flourishing, I just worry about the people that tell me how to flourish. Uh, you know, what, what I want to I'm perfectly happy to say I shouldn't be harming people and I should be preventing harm to other people. But within those limits, let me play golf. You know, and if you like to play tennis, you play tennis. If I like to play golf, I play golf. So there should be, and the flourishing is going to come with us each being able and having the ability to pursue those things that we want to pursue. And ability, well, disability is a type of harm. So when I talk about harms, I mean to include increasing people's ability to get the things that they want in order to make their life a life of flourishing. Okay. Yeah, no, I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, just, yeah. Yeah. it's just I got to do one at a time. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned that, you know, with sort of secular reason, you can get everyone at the table and they can have sort of a common ground to discuss and to reach um, agreement. And you, you mentioned um, the case of rape, yeah, something that's you know, obvious so we can get to the answer to. And I think there's some other things you know, that we can also get to the answer to, such as you know, killing babies and, and stuff like that. But like, what's your view on sort of more difficult, you know, moral disagreements like abortion? I'm, I'm sorry to bring that up, so stereotypical, but, you know, like, things like that when on both sides you have you know, rational arguments that sort of come against each other, and, and you know, do, do you hold the view that, you know, some, some questions just don't have answers, or do yeah. you think that, okay. Some questions don't have answers. I don't know that abortion's one of them, but that's my view. Some questions don't have answers. And if you think, I'm going to reject all of ethics because there are a few questions I can't answer, you're going to end up rejecting all of ethics. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, obviously, you're absolutely right. But I think you're absolutely right about the distinction between Walter's starting point and my starting point. <coughs> For what we think ethics is, there's clearly a very significant uh, difference there. Judgments about. I wouldn't disagree with anything more to seven months. Or seven months. So, um, I, I'm, this is primarily for Walter, but uh, you know, you talk about how the prevention of harm has evolved over time, uh, you know, in, in what's really a descriptive fashion. You know, I mean, that, that describes to me why people today want to prevent harm, but it doesn't address for me the, the normative question. You know, why is it that we elevate the prevention? I mean, it's not just about promoting, like the societies that have uh, performed certain behaviors are now in, you know, in existence versus not in existence, but we actually take that a step further and we say, we, we elevate it to, to the normatively good. How did that transition happen from uh, you know, because it, it seems to me that just sort of an evolutionary description doesn't address the normative question of why we really believe that prevention of harm is the good thing to do. I, com I completely agree it doesn't answer the question, and I want to keep those two questions separate. When I was talking about evolution, I was answering the specific question that was asked about where do we get our inclination to be good, and the answer is from evolution. That's not what justifies us in doing that. I mean, the argument which shows that we ought to, you know, we ought not to cause harm to other people, you know, it's actually very simple when you think about it. It's, look, if you treated me in that way, if you stabbed me in the stomach, I would think you had done something wrong. 
and you shouldn't have done that. And on the other hand, I don't have any reason to think that I have any more rights than you do, so it must be wrong for me to stamp you in the stomach. Simple as that. It's not, it's not that complex an issue that people have to think about, about the kinds of things that they think other people will be justified in doing to them, the kinds of things that would be wrong to do to them, right? And the kinds of things that, and then say, well, why should I be special? But in your view, the only <coughs> reason that that notion is entrenched right now is because it had practical significance because it helped the society survive. But, but there are two questions. One is, how did we come to believe it? And the other is, what justifies it? The story about how we came to believe it might be very different from what justifies it. Now, how did I come to believe it? My parents told me. But what justifies it, now I give you an argument. Very different questions about the historical origin from the philosophical justification. So the evolution is only a story about the historical thing. And I thought you were completely right. You need to keep those two separate. How am I going to get it? question for you. Um, you avoided Walter's questions earlier, um, but I'm going to re-ask the question. Oh, sure. Did I have one of these He said so many wonderful things about this one. So this was about why you thought we shouldn't be legislating Christianity, why we shouldn't impose it on society. Um, and to make an analogy, right, um, if you see a small child drowning in a pool, and you remain an apathetic bystander. I think most people in this room would condemn you for letting the child drown. So carrying that analogy over to society, like people around you that are in a pool, they're drowning, the ones that aren't Christian. How do you justify not participating in public affairs and not legislating morality and not trying to save them? I really accept the analogy. I mean, I mean, why do you I don't, I, I, because I don't see, I mean, let's take Walter for example. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I may feel that um, eschatologically he's dragging, you know, but he's not going to go to heaven or have a heaven one puts it next time. I may, I'm not going to go into the, the theology, there's something in that. But, but he is, he is, he is really, you know, throwing things at me and shouting at me, saying, please do not dive in and save me. You see what I mean? He is, is a rational adult who is not going. <laughs> 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 actually, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm showing respect and humanity and love for him in respecting his rejection of, of the Christian gospel. Now, I want to display that to him as generously, as persuasively, uh, and as selflessly as I possibly can. But by saying, uh, actually, the way I'm going to do that is to make you do the following things, and don't worry, you'll like it. <laughs> <laughs> it to me, that's not evangelism. You see, I mean, that's, that's not a very clever form of evangelism. That's, that's a way to really antagonize Walter and make him think, if anyone with the name Christian ever comes along again, I'm going to tell them where they can jump off. <laughs> so, do you see what I mean? So, I don't, I don't accept the analogy of a small child drowning, because a small child isn't that sort of rational being. And uh, and is apparently asking for help. I don't hear that all all of them seem to be asking for any help from me at all. That's just fine. Uh, but it does affect my judgment of whether I'm pleased on him when he's already made it absolutely clear he doesn't want it. Whereas I think if 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 one person really does love another person, they ought to use an effective means to prevent them from spending eternity in hell. And it might be that an effective means is not going to be to say. You know, you're just wrong and come on really strong, but there ought to be subtle persuasion. Yeah, that's what we're doing today. I mean, if... <laughs> 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 Right, so the goal is to convert as many people as possible. It's just that the techniques are subtle. Um, the goal is, to, that go to, heaven. It is, is to further the kingdom of God at Duke, and that does involve bringing more people to, to love the living God. Right. Um, is there any response to that? 
I never said the rules. Okay, so say um, Walter has a button and you can press it and he can become Christian. Would you do so? Um, or do you value his free will and agency? As Sorry, if Walter has a button. Yes. <laughs> 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 Sneaking up behind him and pressing his button. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're getting, you know, we're getting a bit of a long way down that uh, imaginative journey. <laughs> but um, if if that would be helpful, um, I I I press a button. I mean, I I guess that's what I feel I tried to do around. You know, obviously, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure other other Christians on campus are just the same, and those who support other other. Um, other convictions. I, I, I really, I really want to press a lot of buttons around here and get, and get these kind of conversations going, and, and, and in ways that make Christianity <coughs> seem as you know wondrously joyous as I experience it to be. And what, what makes me sad is that when we get questions about the religious right, or when we get questions about you know bigoted Christians, we we're not seeing. And that's what makes me so cross about creationist intelligent design people. Christianity that portrayed is so miserable. <laughs> and it's it's nowhere near Jesus. Uh, and and I think you're making my job so much harder. But let me point out that you know you might think you could push the button, but actually, if the Bible's accurate, it won't work. <laughs> because Hebrews 10:26 through 27 says. If anyone sins deliberately by rejecting the Savior after knowing the truth of forgiveness, which is me, this, this sin is not covered by Christ's death. There is no way to get rid of it. There will be nothing to look forward to but the terrible punishment of God's awful anger, which will consume all his enemies. So that means pushing the button isn't going to work, at least if the Bible is accurate. There's no way to save someone who has previously rejected the Savior. No hope, eternal damnation, might as well give it up. So this is Dr. Sue's interview. And the question is, how do you, do you see good and bad as the poles of a spectrum, as in the sense that um, you have like a, a final score of morality, kind of like a, um, a final score of morality, kind of like a credit score? Or do you see good and bad um, as as someone being able to be good and bad at the same time in, in possibly different sectors of their life? Like how, how do you guys see good and bad in, within a person? If they can be both at the same time, if it's a, a multiplication of the two, or if they're just separate? Sure. I mean, that's, that, I mean, I, I, I remember, um, I mean, I'm just a, a theological answer I'm going to give now, I, I can't pretend to give any other. Um, I remember going to see a, a person uh, for spiritual direction once who said to me some of the wisest and most memorable words I've, I've ever been told, which I was, it was a stage in my life where I was, I think it was that point that our introducer uh, mentioned about when I used to work in Liverpool. And I was worried that I was working with poor people, but I was worried about my motives for doing so. Uh, and he said, um, you know, we do everything we do in life for a whole bunch of reasons, and if one of those is good, we've got to use that. But if you're going to wait for all 12 of them to be good, you're going to be waiting a lot longer. And I, I, that's continued to stay with me uh, on a personal level ever since. That, you know, I'm a mixed with good and bad. You are, we all are. Um, if I try and make myself good, I'm really trying to make myself God. I'm a creature, I'm not a creator. 
it's, a, uh, it's my job to open myself to allow the Holy Spirit to make something beautiful out of even my pathetic actions. I agree. I've never met anybody who isn't a mixture. mentioned that there are secular, secular societies that um, succeed and get, get along well, and I was just hoping that you could um, mention or like some of your examples of I mean, Japan and Sweden have much, much lower murder rates than, for example, the U.S. and uh, Portugal, both very religious societies. Uh, the murder rate's higher in the more religious parts of the U.S. than it is in the non-religious parts of the U.S. Uh, I, mean, I, I came from a, uh, from Dartmouth a year ago, and in Hanover, uh, there is you know most people are secular and you know doesn't create problems. Uh, the rates of drug abuse and and you know murder and rape and so on are much lower than in areas where religion is very widespread. So I think it holds within the U.S. and across. That study, those studies by Paul and Jensen, which I can show you later. You know, can give you the rates for the different societies, but the Scandinavian countries are, are you know, great examples. Uh, very low rates of, of most forms of harmful immorality, uh, and yet uh, very high rates of sexual. Do you think it's directly correlated with secular factors? I mean, they did multiple regression on on uh, two hundred different factors in the Jensen study, and the answer that they came up with was yes, directly correlated. Correlation doesn't mean causation. It might be that when you live in a society where there's a lot of murder, you come to believe in the devil. And it's the society that makes you believe that. It's not clear that the belief in the devil causes you to, causes you to go out and murder, right? But the correlation seems to be, at least according to their analysis, wasn't modulated by uh, intermediate factors. Um, okay. I really appreciated the discussion so far. It's been great. Um, I have a question for Dean Wells. Um, Augustine, when he's talking about, you've mentioned Augustine earlier, so I'm thinking, I was thinking about what he wrote. Um, when he writes in Confessions in Book 8, he talks about the source of all wisdom being God. And he says that wisdom is to fear God. So it's kind of a circular argument that God gives fear of God. Um, and then moving forward in his script to Calvin, when he talks about his institutes, he talks about the Bible um, being the highest authority in one's life, and the Bible validating the Bible because it says it's the highest authority. So it's another sort of circular argument. And you bring it up to today. You're talking to us about um, a Christian ethic that is designed and focused on a relationship in, with, with the Trinity, I think you mentioned. Um, and I'm just wondering, this argument seems like it's coming around to be some sort of um, some sort of circular, it's coming back upon itself. How what would be compelling to someone to come to understand um, ethics in this way, or why would there be any sort of um, compulsion from someone to believe that sort of understanding of the good? Um, and you were talking about there being a, a desire, an evolutionary desire, in humans to be good for whatever reason, whether it's for the continuation of the species or anything like this. So what would cause someone who has that desire, which should be all of us, to even come to understanding um, good in the ethical sense that you're putting it, because it is some sort of argument that you have to be dependent to understand. Um, I don't think there is a rational form of persuasion that's really valid. Um, I think it's more similar to, to an appreciation of beauty. Uh, it's more like, I mean, I don't think you ought to mention the aesthetic. Uh, Sense. I mean, I, I actually think the aesthetic sense needs to be part of a sense of coming to faith. Um, you, you look at somebody and you say, um, well, okay, put it this way. I mean, I, I do think that the previous discussion is, is, is very troubling to Christians. Um, I mean, I think Walter's criticism there is one of the most profound criticisms of Christianity, is that it doesn't work, does it? You know, that's a really strong criticism. Now, of course, the Christians have got responses. They say, well, we always said it was about sin. Uh, you, you know, so I mean, there, are, you know, there are theological responses. It's not like, oh, this is news to the church, that, that you know, the Christians don't have to be sinners. Uh, 
you know, it's not, ah, what did you say? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, then it, but it is, a, I mean, you know, the, the criticism that you know, Nietzsche's criticism that Christians don't look very redeemed is a, it's a profound, powerful criticism. But having said that, um, you know, I don't know if you know the movie When Harry Met Sally, and, and there's this, the, the, the two of them go out for dinner, and there's a couple of the next door table, and the woman is faking having this profound sexual experience. Uh, you know, and, and, and really, you know, giving it everything. And, and, uh, uh, and, the, and, and the, the table attendant comes up to them and they say, What would you like? And they say, Well, we really like whatever she's had. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I think there has to be an element of that in terms of commending the Christian faith. You know, we Christians have to be living lives that make people think, Oh, I'm going to do that. They seem to be having a good time. <laughs> Not necessarily in a sexual sense, but maybe, <laughs> but, but in a general sense. So that's necessarily not necessarily. Not necessarily. <laughs> so, so, does that, I mean, I, that's what I'm describing as a sort of aesthetic or a kind of mimetic oh, dimension. Right. Uh, so, so that you're saying, wow, um, that is, well, I mean, so, so I mean, put it in simple terms, uh, simplest terms I can, I can imagine to use, is Christianity proposes that the two most powerful forces in the universe are the forgiveness of sins that redeems the past and eternal life that, that gives us the future or redeems the future. And that there's not a great deal in life that doesn't come down to being a prisoner of our past or a prisoner of our future. And if, if the cross of the resurrection of Jesus offer the, the breakthrough on both of those fronts, and if people live lives that show that breakthrough, and people ask them, where do you find that breakthrough to be able to live at peace with your past and live at peace in the future in the face of death and so on? And they say, well, because of cross people think, tell me more about this guy that, that died. Do you see what I mean? It's, so that's a, it's not that's necessarily not a rational act. It's just something that is um, a, a display. It's something more that some, yeah. someone else extracts, you're saying? Yeah, it's not. I mean, and, and I think, uh, maybe in the end, I think life does come down to persuasion rather than argument. I mean, in that sense. I mean, but 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 it's that, that you know it, it's that I I I'd like to I'd like to be like him you know I'd like to that that and I think that's what draws people to faith is that they look at Jesus and think and, and if people don't think that then I wonder what you know I get a bit anxious about what is drawing them uh, do you see what I mean and and, and I don't think that's about rational. Persuasion. You can rationally persuade people to say, um, you know, I think a lot of the problems in life are about unresolved issues from the past, and I think a lot of fears in life are about anxieties about the future. Well, here we are, I've got an answer to both of those. That's a kind of rash, that's just right try to rationalize something. But that, that for me, that to me, that's like giving you the vital statistics of somebody you love. It doesn't really do justice to the love. It's just a rather you know, a simplistic attempt to um, describe it in empirical terms. So it, it's a, in the end, it's 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 love. It's it's, and that means it's, it's rhetoric, it's persuasion. It's and and I would agree. I mean, given that there's no rational argument to persuade people to adopt this Christian ethics, it's got to work in in that way through providing good models that people are going to want to emulate, and through providing a welcoming community. Uh, that is going to help people into, you know, welcome people into that community. Uh, you know, people who feel lonely, they now have friends, and so on. But notice that that's true for good communities. It's also true for bad communities. That's how cults get started. You get people who are lonely and isolated, and you don't have any rational persuasion to get them a member of the cult. You instead show them how much fun it is to be a member of the cult, and you welcome them in, and you create a social community. So that type of what come into my community can be used for good or for ill, because it's not rational persuasion. It's it's simply uh, making sure that you know that they want to be there because they're going to be welcomed and be happy. Uh, and uh, what worries me is that if it can be used for good or for ill then how do we decide when it's being used for one and when it's being used for another? That's why I want to depend on rational persuasion rather than just being a friendly person. This will be our final question. Yes, 
It's all a matter of probability. There are good atheists and they're bad atheists. And there are good theists and they're bad theists. I agree with and people some, who, who believe something strongly enough to go down for it than people who don't. That, sorry, what? The people who believe in something or you know, whether from a religious foundation or from you know some sort of secular rational or anything, yeah. that they believe in something strongly enough that they'll be willing to dead end an ethical discussion because of it. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, it's all a question of probabilities. I, mean, I think secular people are going to be less, you know, in general, on average, just as a percentage, are going to be less likely to do that than religious people. And, you know, you look at the statistics, that happens. Take, for example, the notion of compromise, right? We both have a goal we're trying to reach. Uh, there's a piece of land that said, uh, say there's a tree on my property uh, that's about to fall onto your house. And, uh, and you say, well, you know, I'd like to cut down the tree because I don't want it to fall on my house. And I say, I really like that tree. And you say, well, look, I'll cut it down and I'll pay to have it cut down and have a new one planted, right, in its place. And look, a secular person goes, fine. But a religious person who goes, wait a minute, that's a sacred tree. You can't cut that down. All of a sudden, there's a dead end. Now we can't compromise. That's what worries me. That the types of beliefs that are introduced by religions that are not subject to empirical verification, that are not supported by you know, how we live with each other, but are instead supported by reference to a book or to uh, another world, those are the ones that are going to get in the way. Which is not to say religious people always do that, and it's not to say that atheists never do that. It's to say that those types of supernatural beliefs within religion are what create uh, a an understandable reluctance uh, to compromise when compromise is needed in order to make progress. i just say one, one thing that just maybe nuances my response to the kind of Christians legislating to make people be good discussion we had a little bit earlier about the child, poor child who's still in the water, by the way. I thought I'll go second. I think Christians can can get in, 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 in theological trouble about the notion of sacrifice. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if I understand the cross as being the end of sacrifice, what that means to me is it's the end of us sacrificing others. It's not the, other, the end of us offering ourselves to the living sacrifice. My worry about the Christian voice in big politics in America is it all seems to be asking others to make sacrifices, which it isn't making itself, which is kind of ugly Christianity to me. It's not a, a face that I'm happy to be, be a part of. Christianity, at its best, it seems to me, is constantly willing to make sacrifices in order to bring about peace that others aren't prepared to make. So to use it as an example of the tree. You know, that sort of, this is a sacred tree, therefore you have to suffer because the tree goes on your house. It, you know, is 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 not a face of Christianity that I, you know, that I, it's, I mean, I, I accept the analogy, but I, I, it makes me very uncomfortable to face the reality of, of the analogy that we're to see. And I, I agree with that completely. That's the type of, of Christianity and religion that's the most problematic and the most dangerous. I guess I just one, one more point. What I was sort of pressing is that you know a utilitarian might believe that we should do the best good for all people. You know, coming to the hospital for me, might come up against someone who thinks that we should extend life by all means possible since there's nothing beyond it. Might come to the same moral passe even though neither is grounding our arguments in a religious belief. I mean, they might and they might not. I mean, what actually happened in the history history of hospital ethics committees is that that conflict occurred 
you know, largely in the 60s and 70s, but then people like our own Alan Buchanan, professor here at Duke, you know, argued uh, with great force that in fact what RD does is to ask the patient. And then it doesn't become extending life as much as possible. It becomes granting autonomy to the patient. Uh, and if the patient wants to die, uh, then they should uh, not be have they should not have people force medication and treatment on them without permission. Uh, and so now you've got a compromised position uh, that was accepted in almost all hospitals today. It's certainly legal in 50 states uh, and, and the District of Columbia too. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, it's, you know, there's an example where hospital ethics committees took something that was controversial, right, where problems were being created by a secular absolutist, like you're talking about, uh, and they worked it out. So that's what makes me hopeful that we can uh, we can do that, and it was all done without any reference to religion. Thank you. Um, would you like to make a last final statement? Oh, a last final statement. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather take a couple more questions. Uh, I'd be glad to take another question in lieu of my final statement. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Well, I just think so. A few hands around, and we've had plenty of our statements. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it's short. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, one thing I take from both of your standpoints is. Uh, a bit of confusion where, where to move in the idea of community. And so, so what I mean to say is that both of them, I, I find both of them to some extent <coughs> lonely in the idea that for, if purpose for our Walters is whatever you choose to do, um, and at the same time it, within society, it's society in your community with lots of other people that determines a lot of your abilities to do things, then there's some sort of confliction where you have to acknowledge that your ability to do things has to do with your connection with multiple people, not just your event generality. Absolutely. And, and so then I, I just don't really see how you how the answer can be. It's it's your it, it's all about your autonomy. Um, no, it's not all about your autonomy. At least it's not in my view. I mean, I, and I doubt it is in your view either. No. Uh, no, autonomy is something that's very important, but it's not the only thing. I mean, friendship is what makes people happier than anything else in the. In, you know, you look at all the studies, and what makes you happy is having friends. And I, you know, and therefore friendship is valuable, and it prevents loneliness, which is a type of harm and pain. I mean, when I say harm, I'm, I'm talking, you know, about a wide <coughs> array of things that are bad, including loneliness, not having friends. And that means community is going to be absolutely central to having an important life. But suppose somebody says, I don't want to be in a community. What would you do? I would say, that's a mistake. You'll probably be happy, have less pain and harm and, and loneliness if you make friends. But that doesn't mean I'm going to force them to, right? And so uh, they have the right to do that, and I shouldn't force them to become a, you know, a, a loner out in the, in the desert if they want, a hermit of some sort. Uh, I think it's a mistake, because they'd be happier without it. Uh, just like anybody else, I think. So I think community is important. Friends are important. All that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. What makes you flourish? Well, I think friends and helping other people. Look, there's nothing that makes you happier than helping other people. People ought to get that straight. That's how, you know, that's wonderful stuff. Uh, but that doesn't mean autonomy is not also important. People's rights ought to be respected. So when people don't choose that, I don't force them. So it's really. It's a matter of looking at a lot of different goods and trying to make the world better in all of those ways. So, um, and not, not to be a country, just, just kind of, not to sort of disagree with a lot of the things that you said that were correct, um, I, I'm still not, maybe it's just I'm, I'm doubting things too much, uh, but, I, but I'm still not seeing how the idea that personal happiness will require the vehicle of community answers the question of whether there is an entire personal autonomy or whether you might it might be the you know collective of your local context that you're maybe it's your family that creates one unit of autonomy because of what you can do together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Family's important. 
families ought to be able to determine how their family life goes. Individuals are also important. They ought to be able to determine how their individual life goes. Autonomy can be valuable at both levels. You don't have to pick. Right? That would be my answer, that autonomy of various groups is important, uh, and also of the individual. Uh, but in the end, that doesn't mean that whatever you pick is going to go. Some answers, some choices are still mistaken, because if you choose to be a loner, you probably won't be as happy. What's my evidence for that? I'll show you the studies. I mean, highest correlates with happiness are helping other people and having friends. The, the, cor the, the correlating question with um, uh, the independence of most, most is that uh, having the idea of a personal, but not, you're not, you're not, you didn't share your conception of God with those who understand a similar conception of God, but to some extent your path to get into it is, is a personal conception of God. You don't share it with all Christians, because not all Christians have the same idea. And I'm not sure how that coexists very well with the fact that you're interacting with people who don't share that. Um, the, the I, lot of your I subscribe to the to the creed of the Christian Church. I think they're held by the vast majority of Christians worldwide. Maybe not every single one, but I don't think I'm peculiar in that respect. So I think I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying subscribe to the non-Christians, but I think. Uh, it's, uh, most, most Christians would, would feel quite comfortable saying the creed, so I don't think it's that esoteric. Right. Then, you could, and I guess that's, that's an answer of the communication between people who share the same. And, and I do, I mean, I, I think I am, the realities of my life are baptism and Eucharist. I mean, the realities of, the realities of life is the fact that I, you know, I died in baptism and became part of the body of Christ, uh, and that I, that's renewed every time I share in the body of Christ at the Eucharistic table. And that is my identity as a person. So my identity is fundamentally communal. I have, I, I, if, 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 if and when I stand before judgment seat, the first question will be, why did you come on your own? Where are the others? Um, and, and if, like Walter, I haven't, I mean, you know, Walter puts it very nicely in terms of helping others or how you put that. If I say, oh, I thought it was all about me, that probably won't be an acceptable answer. You know, it, it, it's who have you shared your life with? Will, 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 and, and have they just been people who kind of improved you? <laughs> or were they, you know, <coughs> at least the last and the last? I mean, but that's one of the, it seems to me those are one of the key questions, judgment questions. So my life is bound up in the life of others. I'm not an individual. curious as to, um, the term came up a few times, um, the, the term religion or religious, and I'm curious as to what the you know, definition of religion is, as well as how that relates to doing good. Like being, is, does being religious correlate to doing good, or do you guys see those as two separate terms? I, I don't have a definition of religion. I mean, it seems to me it's a term of art that many people use in different ways. It's not a scientific term like water that you, ah, it seems too low, and you can pin it down like that. Different people are going to use it in different ways. So there are many people who consider themselves to be religious when they don't believe in God, that they're still spiritual. There are other people that think they're religious because they practice the religion, even though they're not even particularly spiritual and don't want to be spiritual. Uh, and there are religions, so-called religions around the world, that don't believe in... Uh, you know, in, in gods of any sort. Uh, I was just in Taiwan in the fall um, for six weeks or so, and you know, Confucianism is often called a religion, and many Confucians just kind of believe in any of that stuff. Uh, but they call it a religion uh, because it's you know because it's got similarities in some way. They have temples and so you know. So religion is one of these terms where there are paradigm cases, and then different cases get further and further. So I don't have any any precise definition, but under any reasonable definition, I would claim it, it doesn't bear any essential relationship to good or bad or right or wrong, uh, especially moral good or bad. Um, I 
I think I'd actually disagree with Walter on, on the second point, but I agree with him entirely on the first point. I mean, I, I'm, I'm very reluctant to get into a definition of missionary. I've played with, around with ideas of the hospital and the, um, and camera. And I mean, uh, people say, you know, when I say that uh, camera is a, is a place of worship, and they challenge it, and they say, well, it's only about, you know, things like I, I ask them what the phrase, go to hell, Carolina, means. <laughs> uh, so, so there are, there are profound, you know, there are profound feelings of meaning and identity wrapped up in many sorts of activities, which I would call it, you know, analogously religious and sometimes genuinely so. Um, but I do say to my religious life staff, I mean, there are, as you may know, there are 35 or so campus ministers representing about 25 different groups at Duke, and I meet with them every couple of weeks, and one of the things I say to them is that when I've been put under pressure by one or two of them, I won't say which, one or two of the people there to um, to to call what we do religion. And I say, I, I'm not going to uh, collude with a definition of what we all do that, that enables others to regard us all as irrelevant. Because the definitions of, a, of religion tend to be very privatized, uh, tend to be very, um, you know, about service projects and about inner dispositions and things, and they're, they're, you know, they're none of them affect the status quo, the status quo politically or anything of that kind. Uh, and those are all definitions to make us irrelevant, as far as I'm concerned. So I, I, I'm, uh, I would say that uh, uh, that religion and ethics are, are, are very closely aligned. Because a broad sort of definition of religion is, for me, just just about uh, convictions about if you like the unknown. But they're also, I mean, you know, religio is about what you bind yourself to uh, in terms of its etymology. Uh, and you, buy, uh, you know, we all bind ourselves to a certain kind of rule of life, a routine, if you like, most, most basic. And I would suggest that if you want to know what someone's religion is, if you take the view that I, that I do, that we all have a religion in that sense, in that very minimal sense, uh, secularists, Christians, every, everybody, uh, then I would say, well, it, don't let's call it a big word like religion. Tell me about what your routine is and what you would die for. Uh, and I think that that's more or less the ground to which I would find out what I felt about religion. That kind of religion, I mean, as if, if, uh, if, you, if you define a term so that everybody's religious, including the atheists, which you yeah. said, then it's not clear what the point is anymore, because we now have a distinguished people who have a religion from, from Well, because don't. then we, then we. And, look, look, look. And, and I would also say, you know, this test of, well, what would you die for? Us? Well, I'm sorry, I like Duke, but I'm not dying for Duke. And I don't think Carolina ought to go to hell, and I hope you don't either. It's an expression. Uh, and so people can be committed you know, to something that's important to them, a community of value and so on, uh, without it achieving, you know, this monumental uh, kind of level uh, that many uh, of the more commonly called religions uh, want to impose on. Yeah. And that's what bothers me is, is the, you know, is the kind of level of, I mean, I would call it fanaticism. Uh, that gets uh, that gets put on top of, of some religious commitments. I got no problem with commitment. Uh, it's when it reaches you know too far that it creates problems. Yeah, I mean in general, I think we've come back to this a number of times, and I guess that I'm happy this is the last thing I say. That uh, um, I don't like getting into conversation between people who believe and people who don't believe. What I always say to people who say they don't believe is, "Tell me what you do believe." Yeah, and that's why I've been pushing all the time
Um, before you all leave, I'd like to make a quick plug for some of our other events. Um, on Monday, from 4 to 5.30, we're going to be having a launch party for our new blog. Um, and it's going to be kind of covering uh, news that you probably haven't heard about. First question uh, we're going to ask is, like, is throwing dead animals wrong? What if it's for charity? And there's actually a story behind that, so you can check out the blog and find out about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, um, we will have I think, which are um, kind of similar to this, but a much smaller scale event on Thursday nights throughout the semester in the Green Love Reading Room, and there's a schedule with the topics of those on the floor. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.